Shabbat Shalom. This is Shabbat Pinchas, and we're again reading from the book of Bamidbar. The scriptures tell us in this parasha that there was a famine in our land. This famine, which had actually been sent by God, had already lasted three and a half years. Physical deprivation was obviously not enough to convince the people after three and a half years, or even the leaders, much less their very evil king, Achav, and his pagan queen, Jezebel, of their need to repent. The spiritual deprivation had not even been noticed. The northern kingdom of Israel had no relationship to the Mikdash or to the temple worship at the best of times. As their first ruler, as we have been learning in uh, the 12, Jeroboam I had set up golden calves in two locations, two cities in his kingdoms, and these were worshipped. And of course he had, he had established a priesthood and they mimicked many of the the uh, sacrifices and, and other uh, activities in the temple. Ahaz and Jezebel's commitment to idolatry was a decisive rejection of the God of Israel. Of course, Jezebel was a pagan. They rejected not only the God of Israel, but his commandments, the way of life he had enjoined upon the people of Israel. And so God's people, Israel, were living pagan, idolatrous lives. As with all God's actions, this famine had been sent for a purpose. And that purpose was to encourage our people to repent and to be restored to our covenant relationship with Hashem. Today, there is a famine in the world. I'm not talking about the lack of food in various parts of the world, although we all know that this has become a monumental concern. I'm talking about the deprivation um, of Many, and it's not just poor people. No, this famine is not of a physical nature. It is one in which the wealthy are as starved, perhaps more so, um, as the most hungry and the most poor of those in places like Zambia and Kenya. This is a spiritual famine of immense proportions. People are hungry for spiritual food that comes only from God. They are like people who eat junk food, not realizing that these foods are totally devoid of what is needed to meet their nutritional needs. They settle these spiritual junk food people settle for fast food of, of the spirit. Religiosity, religion, spiritual counterfeits, cults, the occult, media, um, media religion, online TV spirituality, all of these things that are not of God. These people don't even know they're missing anything. That's the saddest part. They think that the places they have gone for spiritual food are satisfying. They choose from the menu of Eastern religions and secular science, Christianity, traditional Judaism, 
New Age philosophy, humanism, or the new paganism. They think they're healthy. They think they are making wise decisions, but they are sick and they are weak. They are starving for the truth of God, truth which leads one to a path of repentance and reconciliation with God. As in Eliyahu's day, there are many today who waver between God's truth and the deceptions of Hasatan under the misconception that God will not mind. They are under the delusion that any path and their own intelligence will lead them to truth. In that day, Eliyahu was the only prophet left. He was the only prophet remaining in the whole of the kingdom of Israel. He believed that he was the only follower of God remaining there until God pointed out that 7,000 of the B'nai Israel had refused to worship Baal. Not a large number. In fact, almost insignificant. Maybe you feel that you are just as alone as Eliyahu and those 7,000. Even among your friends and family or in your local community, as you seek to follow God and make a firm commitment to his, his biblical commandments, his plan and his purpose, and in your commitment to a Torah lifestyle and a righteous life. There were people in Eliyahu's day who thought they could be part of the popular religious scene and still follow God. And there are people like that today. But there are irreconcilable differences between the faithful and the nearly faithful. The scriptures show us that it is dangerous to believe you can participate in that which is not directly from God and yet somehow avoid being damaged by it. Yaakov tells us that the double-minded man or woman is unstable in all his or her ways. One must follow scripture to the logical conclusion or, of course, be inconsistent, eventually becoming indifferent and then lukewarm to that which is true and good and right. God says of those who are tepid in their faith that he will repudiate them utterly. But just as Eliyahu was not alone in his faithfulness to God and his commitment to righteousness, you are not alone. It is important that you worship with those of like mind who have the same commitment to God and his commandments and that you're in constant fellowship. We're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, uh, assembling for sound teaching and exhortation as part of a community with the same faith. Otherwise, you will gradually grow cold. You may not even realize it. And you could die spiritually. There may be, of course, a cost for following Hashem. There often is. In order to do what God wants, you may have to move house, change jobs, relocate, or even travel some distance, as some of us do each week, to be at Shabbat services. Ovadia 
was an important man in King Achava's house, but he, he feared and honored the God of Israel. We're told that even in the household of such a wicked man, there was a man who worshipped the one true God. This man had, at the risk of his own life, saved the lives of a hundred Nevi'im, a hundred prophets of God, by hiding them in caves and providing food for them. This man also showed respect and honor to Eliyahu. We see by this that it is quite possible to live amidst wickedness and yet be used by God for his purposes and to bring honor to him. But what about the subject of our worship? There were many people in Eliyahu's day, as there are now, <clears throat> pardon me, who think that a God by, by any name is the same like those golden calves of King Jeroboam. Many people went to worship them. Some people think that there are many names for God and that it really doesn't matter whether you call on Hashem or Krishna or Allah or Buddha. But there is something in a name and there is only one true God. He is Adonai, Lord and Master of all things. He is Elohim, <clears throat> God, Creator, Preserver, Transcendent, Mighty. This is a plural noun, but it is used with singular verbs. El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient One. El Elyon, the Lord Most High. El Gibor, the Mighty God. El Olam, the Everlasting God. Adonai Yira, the Lord Provides. Adonai Rofe, the Lord Who Heals. Adonai Shama, the Lord Is Present. Adonai Mikdash, the Lord who sanctifies. Adonai Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. Kadosh by Yisrael, the Holy One of Israel. He calls himself that many, many times. The names of God, which are many, describe him as the only king the only creator, the only judge, the only eternal one in the universe. And he tells us in the first commandment, there are to be no other gods beside me. Consider the words of Tehillim 9, verse 11 in the Hebrew scriptures. And those who know your name. So it's important to actually know his name. Shall trust in you. For you have not forsaken those who seek you, O Lord. There is no way one can follow the God of Israel while calling upon him by the name of another deity. That's right. One cannot worship the true God in the company of those who bow to another. The scriptures tell us that our God is a jealous God. He rejects all who do not worship him in obedience in truth, his truth, that is. God is not present in places where he is not honored as the God he has revealed himself to be. 
one cannot truly worship God surrounded by those who are worshiping an idol, literally worshiping Hasatan. In order to worship and honor the one true God, the God of Israel, one must have the right understanding and the right perspective. In Eliyahu's day, truth was on trial. Eliyahu, the one prophet of God who was left, proposed a test to the so-called prophets of Baal. There were hundreds of them. These people believed just as fully in their God as Eliyahu did in the God of Israel, the one true God, which shows that neither sincerity nor commitment are in and of themselves a sign of truth, nor are they of value to God. The test that Eliyahu proposed to these prophets of Baal left everything up to God. There was nothing Eliyahu could do to precipitate a response. So while the prophets of Baal danced around in a frenzy, cutting themselves with knives, screaming, crying, and doing everything they could to get a response from their God, Eliyahu ordered that water be brought to be poured on his altar and on the sacrifice. And then he prayed a simple, basic, but incredibly powerful prayer. Listen to this prayer. Adonai, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzchak, ve Elohe Yisrael. Let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God. This trial was not about Eliyahu's desire to be proved right, or about proving the prophets of Baal wrong. It was for the sake of God's honor. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to bring honor to our God. We have the opportunity, but often, as when we debate religious issues with someone, it is about our honor not God's, and about our gift of rhetoric, and about how much we know, not about the clear truth of God. We need to reflect upon what we're doing with our lives and ask if we can say with Eliyahu that our actions are at God's bidding and for his glory alone. At the end of your life, you don't want to be in a position of saying, did I do enough? You want to know that what you've done and the way in which you've lived has been right with God and that he is ready to say, good and faithful servant, enter into my rest. We should pray that God will move by his Ruach, upon our family members who don't know him. We all have family members who don't know God. Our friends and those in this community, the, the Jewish community, for the sake of his name, for his glory. Like Eliyahu, we need to pray every single day that God will be known in Israel and among our people everywhere in the diaspora. That God will be known throughout the earth. 
that God will be known in Boreham Wood, in Hertfordshire, in England, in the UK, in Europe, throughout the world. We know that one day, perhaps not so very far in the future, every knee will bow to the God of Israel and every tongue will proclaim him as king. Getting back to our narrative, what happened? Well, God answered Eliyahu, whose name is a definitive and profound statement in itself, meaning yod heh vav -Hey is God. After he prayed, the very next words are, then fire from Adonai, no question about the source, descended and consumed the burnt offering. The wood, the stones, the earth, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. The offering itself and everything surrounding it was consumed by the fire sent by God. Nothing remained that had not been touched by God. Mishpucha, members and friends of B'nai Maccabim, we need to become like that offering. Rav Shaul declares that we should be living sacrifices set apart unto God. That is, for God's use only. When we pray, it should be that God will make himself known and we should be prepared for him to act upon our offering. We should desire and we should expect that our sacrifice will be consumed, that it will be used, utilized, employed, absorbed by the fire of God. God proved to Israel that day that he is a consuming fire. He absorbs and takes hold of the totality of the sacrifice. Eliyahu Hanuvi was consumed by the fire of God. Rav Shaul was consumed by the fire of God. Many of the most righteous of our people at Shavuot were consumed by the fire of God. Cornelius and his family and friends were consumed by the fire of the God of Israel. Is the fire of God a consuming fire in your life? Have you offered yourself to Hashem so that he may take hold of you and touch every area of your life? When the people of Israel saw that the fire from God had absorbed the sacrifice, the wood, the water, and everything around it, they threw themselves on their faces in awe and, finally, repentance. Repentance before our God. And they cried out, Adonai hu Elohim, Adonai hu Elohim, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Is this the proclamation of your life? Do you declare it every day through all that you do and say, through your choices, your lifestyle, your words, and your actions? Our people here in Israel and everywhere need to know Adonai Hu Elohim. The Lord is God.
It is for us to pray down fire from heaven, to consume the sacrifice that each of us is supposed to be before God, to pray that God will be exalted, that he will be known to those with whom we come into contact through us. When you are consumed by the fire of God, everything and everyone around you will be touched by it. Those who see the consuming fire of God will fall on their faces and affirm the Lord is God. These are the words of the Vene Mar, part of the Elenu. We're going to um, conclude the service with the Elenu. When you sing it at home or say the words at home, Ask God to make you a living sacrifice consumed by his fire. Then shall the words be fulfilled. The Lord shall be king forever. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord shall be one and his name one. Sanctify his name. Be a living sacrifice and allow Hashem to consume that sacrifice. God bless and keep you. Shabbat Shalom.